Hello and welcome to Cedar Creek Homestead. I hope you're having a wonderful day today. Appreciate you joining me today and got me a good old glass of iced tea. Good stuff and it's still warm out here. Um, summertime has not left us yet. I, I keep hearing that it's supposed to and we're going to have a cold spell. But it's just not here. And uh, we have gotten down last night. The low was 71. But it got up in the 90s again today. So it's pretty hot. And the past seven days we've had uh, over three inches of rain. Actually, we had over four inches. We had a system come through. We got three and then we got another. So we've had over four inches of rain in the past seven days. We're way ahead for annual rainfall. In fact, the uh, weather had said it was going to have a drying uh, spell and we were going to start turning dry and then all of a sudden they forecasted rain and we had a little storm system come through here, had uh, flood warnings and everything, you know how they do when you're getting heavy rain and, and a short amount of time we had three inches of rain and then just a day or two or three ago we had another inch. So real thankful for the rain and uh, the subject today is, uh, I'm going to call it the top three things if I was starting out homesteading, uh, how I would get started. And this was presented by one of the viewers. If I had an acre to start off with, what would I do? And um, I guess, um, first off, I'd met, if I was going to purchase an acre... Uh, however you went about finding the location for that one particular acre, is it a place that's good for homesteading? And what I mean by that, are there covenants, are there ordinances, things that would keep you from, ha from having a uh, homestead? And uh, one of those things is animals. A lot of places now don't want you having animals where you live at. I think that's horrible. My great-grandmother lived right here in town and had chickens and uh, uh, milk cow and stuff on two what they call city lots. That's not very big. And she raised a big garden, had chickens and a milk cow clear up till she was around 90 year old before she quit those things. And she lived to be 94, 95 year old. I lived a very long lifestyle. Life span and ended up getting cancer and died of cancer so uh, you know you say what you want to about being healthy uh, she was very healthy she looked like uh, Granny Clampett on the Beverly Hillbillies uh, my another grandmother on my mother's side uh, she lived to be uh, I believe it was 92 year old at, uh, she was over 90 and I think she made it to the age of 92 and had never been in the hospital for anything until she turned 90 years old and uh, they had her a birthday party on her 90th birthday party uh, and uh, I teased her that she'd had too much to drink but grandma never drank she was not a drinker at all but she fell and broke her hip and ended up in the hospital at 90 year old and the um, while she was there they told her uh, that she had a bad heart and that they would love to do surgery and they could fix the problem but at her age and stuff that she probably would never survive and that it wouldn't give her enough uh, years to uh, make a difference and um, so um, they fixed her hip she had fell and broke it and she lived through that and got to where she was getting around good lived another couple of years and she just took sick all of a sudden and uh, went in the hospital and died and that was the end of it. But she lived for years um, in the country and had I would say about two acres of land. Didn't have much property. But uh, just to give you an example what I would do would be much like her situation. She had a well. Water is a very important source of a uh, very important thing. You're going to have to have water where you're at. She finally, um, um, my grandmother, her name was Nada, and she uh, ended up getting water uh, 
rural water hooking up when she was in her 80s, her kids kept on until she finally hooked up to rural water. She had a little trouble. She got her water in later years. She had a well. In later years, she started getting her water out of a pond, and she actually had a pump house and a chlorinator and stuff. Uh, prior to that, she got her well water out of an old hand-dug well, and she had one of them long metal buckets, and when we would go there, she would drop that metal well bucket down in the well, and she'd get her water, and she was always afraid as kids would fall into that well. It was rocked up a ways, um, high enough that us kids couldn't have fell in unless we would have climbed up on it, and she kept a wooden deal over it. You see them like this in the westerns, a lot, but uh, but that would be number one is water. <clears throat> she also had uh, an old house. Before I came along, she had a house with dirt floors. And uh, in modern times, well, what was considered modern times, my uh, grandmother Nada, she got uh, my dad and uh, different ones helped. They tore down an old house and built her another home. And it was out of old, old materials, but at least it had a wooden floor. And they bought linoleum and put down. But she didn't have running water in the house. But she survived fine. She had raised 12 kids. And, of course, she had running water because they would run and go get it. But uh, water was very important. And one thing that they did on the newer home this might have been in the ground all along, but they had a cistern in the ground. And a cistern is uh, just a hand dug pit down in the ground. Now hers was actually had concrete walls and old brick and stuff they had made. And she had a sidewalk in front of her house. This house was not fancy by no means, but it had a concrete sidewalk in the front yard part going in front of the house before you stepped up on the front porch you walked down this sidewalk and she had one of those old hand pumps that you could pump water out of the cistern and they used that to wash clothes and she had an old ringer washing machine on the front porch and I remember going down there when we were kids she still had children at home when my mom had me and uh, so um, she's got kids uh, I got a son my age actually so that's that tells you the span of her 12 kids but anyway, when my mom was having me, actually a year before, on the same date, July 18th, 1968, uh, my grandmother gave birth to her last child, a son, and then a year later, on July 18th, 1969, I was born. <clears throat> Very strange <laughs> things. And so, uh, but my grandmother had a ringer washer on the front porch, and they would hand pump up this water out of this cistern, if not, they had to bring water from the well, or they also had a creek back behind them they could get water. The creek water was kind of muddy water, so you wouldn't have really wanted to use that unless you just had to, but they had times that they had had to bring in water off the creek, but normally they would get it out of the cistern. They had guttering, homemade guttering, on the house, and it had an old metal roof, sheet on roof. The house is still standing today, and it's still got a sheet on roof. After my uh, grandma died, one of her sons, who had really helped take care of her and stayed by her side all the way through after my grandfather had passed away, uh, they just kind of, the other kids just said, that's yours, and he's got that. I believe it's just a couple acres. It could be three or four acres, but it's not much property there. And I will find out for sure and tell you sometime on a later video. But anyway, they had plenty of water. So water is very important. But it had homemade guttering, and they would take these big old silver foot tubs, we call them, and they would put those under the guttering so when it rained it would fill those up and then they would take buckets up on the porch and dump into this ringer washer an old Maytag ringer washer and uh, so and when I was on up in uh, maybe 
12, 13, 14 year old, something like that, they built a lean-to onto my grandmother's house and they put a pump out by the well, but instead of pumping the water out of the well, I really don't know what happened if it, the well went dry or what, but they began to pump water out of this old pond at my grandmother's house and they added in a chlorinating system that uh, would chlorinate the water and some filters and then it was uh, potable water in the house and uh, prior to that time if we went to grandma's house uh, she'd have pitchers of water that she'd brought in out of the well setting on the sinks and uh, if you washed your hands or anything you poured that water over your hands and washed your hands and the bathroom was outside they had an outside toilet down on the creek and it was a two-seater I've never understood why you would have a two-seater toilet but uh, that would be something to take into consideration will they allow you uh, could you hook up to rural water or could you put in a pump or something or you could have modern toiletry stuff is and, and if you chose not to some posts people have a, a humanure type system where they uh, uh, have composting little toilets and they use that humanure for different things uh, it sounds kind of gross to me but uh, my, the, what they did back in those days, I don't know how it was everywhere, but around here, my grandpa that lived over here had an outhouse. Even though they had running water, uh, they had built a lean-to onto the house. Most homes around here had a little lean-to built on, and they would put a uh, bathtub and a sink and a toilet, and they would be real small. My grandpa's house had that. My grandmother, Nada's house. Uh, my great-grandmother's house here in town, they all had these added on. But I can remember when they added it on to Grandma Nada's house. And uh, anyway, they. Uh, but water was very important. Now, where, if, where you go, you might say, I'm going to use a composting toilet. Uh, they probably wouldn't let you get by with an outhouse. But around here, they would have a bag of lime, like you put on your garden uh a brown paper bag type of lime. I see these. You can still get them at uh, tractor supply and places. And they'd have a little scooper. And you, after you poo pooed, you'd put the scooper of lime on top of your poo poo. And that helped keep the flies away. And I assumed it helped uh, decompose the uh, stuff so it wouldn't stink and stuff. But anyway, uh, my grandfather's old uh, outhouse over here was on the creek bank. And uh, we would use it if we was out working on the farm, but normally if you was in the house or whatever, come over to eat, you would use the uh, inside toilet. i tell you a little funny story. Uh, one of my aunts was dating a guy, and uh, when she was in high school, and he is old enough to drive, and he'd come over here and eat with them. When they built their lean-to onto my dad and them's old home place and got modern uh, plumbing inside, um, and started using indoor toiletries, he wouldn't eat with them no more. And my grandpa asked him one day, said, you used to eat with us all the time. Said, why won't you eat with us anymore? And he said, well, my daddy says you don't eat in the same house where you use the bathroom. So uh, anyway, uh, different times, you know, now we don't think anything of it. Um, you know, uh, it's just, uh, you know, Back in those days, people didn't know what indoor toiletry was. But if you was going to have a homestead, I would say number one is making sure you're going to have water. And if I had to do water catchment, if they would allow you to do water catchment, I've heard some say that in certain areas it's against the law to catch water off of your house. That's crazy. But uh, right here, I have a we're not we, we're wanting to do water catchment just for fun just to get used to it in case something ever happens to the rural water system I have a well over here it has sulfur water there's another well on my property back over here that I could uh, draw water out of that is good water uh, there's another sulfur well up here so I'd have plenty of sources and I have drank sulfur water sulfur water isn't bad uh, it's just you got to get used to it and you can smell it if you've not been around it and you go to someone's home around here that has sulfur water you can smell it as you come up in the yard so I would uh, you take some getting used to my wife's uncle over in Arkansas I don't know if he still has sulfur 
uh, water or not, but he uh, used to, you, I could smell it when I come into their home, and they rent a couple of refrigerators because they had sulfur water. Sulfur will attack the copper on your refrigerator and cause the Freon to leak out. In the old days when they had the propane type refrigerators, um, the servals and stuff, they had steel lines and it would not affect them. But nowadays they use copper on a lot of the refrigerant lines and it will eat into that and turn it green and it will start leaking the Freon out. So um, just different things you got to kind of take into consideration. But here we have a lot of sulfur water. I, I, I can drink it. A lot of people here would use it to feed their livestock and water their garden and then keep back in the day uh, they would keep good water for other things this well out here worked for water and gardens and stuff I need to put a well pump back in it and water my garden they say your tomatoes will do very well with that but anyway having a source of water if I had anything I'd say that's the number one source but I put buckets out here under my carport on each corner and we can get just a little bit of rain and it will fill four uh, five gallon buckets up with uh, uh, water so I'm like that is a pretty good uh, uh, a pretty good way to get water if you need water so um, anyway uh, this video is going to be too long to get into all the different things but I would say my number one concern would be water and then to I'm not going to elaborate on it but the number two thing is having a place to raise a garden you could do raised beds. Um, you could have a. I have a garden spot that I can actually till up. And uh, originally, here where we live at, we have a double wide trailer in a shop, and I have two acres. Uh, now I have a, more than two acres here. Um, I guess there's 70 acres here now that I actually uh, own, and then I lease some land, but for the cows and stuff. But I could live on this two acres right here. I could have chickens. I could have a garden. I could raise a big part of my own food on just two acres of property. And there's some people called Nancy and Hollis. Uh, find them on YouTube and watch their videos. They have moved to Florida now and they have a big piece of property. But uh, they got into healthy food and raising their own food. And Nancy and Hollis lived in town on a little bitty piece of property, and they raised all kinds of food. Now, I don't know that they ever had chickens or any kind of meat source, uh, but uh, you could probably get to watching them and text them and ask them what they would have done for meat sources, but they had plenty of vegetables. In fact, you can make it on vegetables. You don't have to have meat. I would hate to think about going without meat, but here we have chickens, things, but be able to see if you could raise a garden. Anyway, my number one choice, the third thing I would have, is I would make sure that I could have some kind of animal for a meat source. And my choice of all the animals out there to have as a meat choice for a homesteader would be um, um, chickens. And uh, we raise chickens, I've raised rabbits, we have beef, I've raised hogs. I've raised quail, I've raised pheasants, I've got turkeys, ducks, everything, but my number one choice would be poultry. And I would see if I was going to have, if I could raise poultry there, I'd start working on, that's the third thing, uh, if I didn't like chicken, maybe you don't like chicken, maybe you are a vegetarian and wouldn't want to eat meat at all, then you wouldn't have to worry about this one, but I would have... I'd start to work on a meat source, and my choice of that would be poultry. You can have a little old chicken yard. It doesn't cost a lot to feed your chickens. If you get a broody type of chicken, they will set and reproduce. So they'll set on eggs, uh, raise uh, uh, babies. Our neighbors uh, went to California years ago. They had a rough time when they got there. Uh, way back, I guess it's Depression era days, but they used to tell this story, they've passed on now, but that they ran out of uh, the workplace headed out on them. They, they weren't there when they got there. So they used all their money to get there, and they basically about starved to death. And the next spring, they managed to get some chickens, and they would double set them. One hen would set, they'd take uh, two hens get set, and they'd take the chickens from two hens and put with one and reset this hen over here, 
and let her have babies. And they would set and triple set and do things and raise big bunches of chickens. And they said they ate like, ate like kings the next year. They had chicken and they had vegetables. They raised a big garden and they canned and put up stuff. Chickens to me would be the main source. You can also prep back food for chickens real easy. I feed a, a big can of coffee can size to my chickens um, once a day. I also supplement with uh, laying uh, mash and I keep it out for them. Right now I keep it all they can eat. Now later there's no need in letting them have all they want to eat but it's because I have a bunch of young ones and I want to promote growth on them. But if I'm letting them out to free range during the day and I've been doing that more here lately I was keeping them up because the young ones uh, were having uh, um, I, wasn't, I was afraid something would catch them so I put the young ones in with the older ones and I'm getting them used to roosting in there in the hen house with the old ones and they, they're they getting acclimated and everything's working fine now so nonetheless they uh, I get a coffee can of feed plus I feed them all they want of uh, laying mash right now that's just instead of laying pellets it's just to ground up stuff and they get that and one coffee can of corn but in the winter um, I'll still feed them a little bit of land mash, but I cut back. They just get a can or two of that a day plus land pellets if I'm allowing them to run loose. Now, if stuff starts catching them, that's something, too, you got to think about is how you would protect your animals if you're in an area. Can, can you build a pen? And build a good pen. Uh, if you're going to build a chicken house, I say build a good uh, poultry house. Build one that's going to stand a while. Build it out of metal. You know, you have wood poles, but put metal on the outside. Fix something that's nice. Don't just build an old junky um, um, chicken house that's going to rot down in a year or two. If you're serious about this thing, get in there and build stuff that will last. But that would be my first to three things. The main thing is water source. The next thing would be where I could grow a garden. Third would be a meat source, and my preference of the of all the meat sources would be poultry. Um, then, uh, of course, I left out a number one thing, and that's your home. And really, that would probably be first, but I'm assuming you already have figured out where you want to live at. Up here, not far from here, is an old road they call Moonshine Highway. And a lot of people bought land back up there. A guy owned a big old ranch. And he began to sell off the property years ago. It's still being sold off. But you could buy an acre or two acres or five acres, whatever you wanted. And a lot of people lived in old buses and stuff and put wood stoves in them, and they survived. And now, and as people got uh, into that, they were able to build uh, uh, actual homes and stuff besides living in the buses and things. But they'd buy an old school bus for four or 500 bucks and make it a home. Uh, people lived in that and raised families over there. You don't have to have the fanciest home. A lady not far from here uh, I did a repair for and she bought a little tiny home. And I mean it is tiny but she's got all the modern conveniences and stuff and is raising her um, she's divorced I, and uh, got a couple little children but she's raising her family there and bought some land. She bought land cheap and uh, moved, uh, bought this little house cheap where she wouldn't be in debt and she's doing very well on it. And I was like, you know, you can do on a little. You don't have to have a big home to start out with and uh, you can start out very small but one of the things I would say is keep your overhead low. And what I mean by that, it sounds like I'm giving a business uh, coaching but you know, uh, if you start a business you want to keep your overhead, your expenses low homestead and keep your expenses low and as you become because uh, at first it takes a lot of money to get going and once you really get up and going and things are going good then you can add to it and you can expand and build but that would be my first top three things and I hope this answers uh, the viewers question there's so much more into it you could get in very very much uh, in depth with it and uh, farther than what I am and just this little video is not even but that's what I would do if I was going to get started I'd do those three things and focus on them first sure appreciate you watching God bless you we'll see you next time on Porch Talk here every Tuesday night at 7 o'clock
we're gone.